So 1216 here corresponds to hex NAC 2, hex 5. But so ha yeah, having converted all of those um, masses into sugar compositions, you can then go back and do another search where, where you specify what the sugar compositions are. So instead of looking for any mass modification, which is considering a lot of possibilities, you can now say, I only want to consider the sugar structures that I identified in that first search. And so if you then do the same search with these specified modifications, you identify a lot more glycopeptides because you're considering a lot fewer possibilities. And so um, a, yeah, a spectrum doesn't need to match as many fragment ions in order for it to be significant. And so using this, you can get much more extensive um, glycopeptide identification. And that's it. So uh, a, a few acknowledgements. So uh, Kathleen Medzaratsky um, has, has done a lot of this analysis with me. It, most of the data I've showed you today it is from mouse liver, and, and that sample was prepared by Krista. Um, Peter Baker is the person who develops the software, this protein prospector that I mentioned. So this is software that's available on the web and anyone can use. And we also have funding support from the NIH. And I'm ready to take questions. I have several questions, Robert. Okay. And um, my first question is regarding, um, you said that these were samples from liver. Yes. And so how, how do you process the samples to get where you are? Do you need to partially purify the proteins and have like a set of proteins or, or can you just put the mixture? So the data we had here was wholesale. There was no enrichment at all. Um, in actual fact, a lot of, a lot of the um, glycoproteins we're identifying are not the sort of glycoproteins people traditionally associate. We're, 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 ident we're identifying a lot of proteins from the endoplasmic reticulum and, and uh, intracellular compartments, which are things that co uh, conventional methods don't often identify because mo most of the strategies when they're looking at end-link glycosylation, they're, they're cleaving the sugar off intact cells and so that they don't even have access to all this other glycosylation. And so yeah, we, we have... Yeah, proteins in the endoplasmic reticulum, we have proteins from the lysosome, uh, and we also have membrane proteins and secreted proteins as well. So my second question is related to when you, you say, um, I have a peptide and then I'm looking for modifications on that peptide, that means that first you have to have like the CID data so you know what size of peptide or what peptide that is. So then you can look for the modifications? Um, no, you don't need this. So use, using this, this mass modification strategy here, so on, on here you can, you can just tell it that the modification is a mass and you can consider any of these masses. So th this is the most effective way to identify the peptide. The problem is if you're doing the collision-induced dissociation, you get very little fragmentation from the peptide. It's all fragmentation of the sugar component. And so it's very difficult to identify what the peptide is. So if you're, if you're analyzing a single protein, then it's, it's quite easy because there's probably only two or three peptides that you need to consider. And so you can sort of manually work it out. But if you're working with a, a mixture of 3,000 proteins, then you can't, you can't predict what the peptide is going to be. Yes, that's what I was thinking. How could you yep. predict and then... Yes. Tell the system to know that there was a difference. Hi. Uh, about this protein prospector, to see it, uh, well, can you put the next slide? In this one, are there, no, are those all peptides who people have um, identified or they are theoretical? So this is real data. So, um, these, these are all fragmentation spectrum from the same analysis, um, and this is a subset. So uh, this is the number 12 protein that was identified in this sample. So there were 11 proteins that were identified more confidently, and uh, there are three or 400 underneath that all have this type of pattern. Not necessarily as many as this, but um, 
yeah, we've, we've acquired a large number of fragmentation spectra. So for this study, we, we may have acquired um, 100,000 fragmentation spectra. And these are just 20 of them. And so some, some of these are the same peptide that have been fragmented more than once. So we, we did um, a fractionation beforehand. So we did some high pH chromatography beforehand to simplify the mixture. And in some cases, the same peptide is, is identified in multiple fractions. And that's why it appears multiple times here. But these are all real examples. And um, if the software was up here, I, mean, I can give you a demonstration. If there's, if there's internet, you can click on this particular peptide, and it will show you the fragmentation spectrum for that particular one. Are IBT7 or Auditorio? Yes. Does that work on my CCBSF? Yes. Unable to connect. Unable to connect. It says, Omar says yes, you should be able to connect. But computer says otherwise. However, we'll fix it for tomorrow because okay. uh, for the <laughs> for the practical session tomorrow, if you have a computer, you should bring it. Anybody else has a question? Oh dear. <laughs> Robert, uh, the, 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 the charge of the peptide, the Greek peptides, is uh, four in. in all of the peptides uh, identified here. Uh, How many charts you permit to the in the search? So I mean, when you put the parameters, you allow the fragmentation for just one, two, three, four, five. How many charts you permit? So um, this this is all the track data, so it's high resolution data. So you can tell the charge from the, um, the MS data. So the, I know. But so you're talking about in the acquisition? In the acquisition mode. Um, I think, I don't think we're restricting it at all. You permit all? Uh, all charge sets. All charge sets. Yeah. Ooh. From the, the lecture given yesterday uh, by the Professor Pauline Ruth, we, we know that the the relation of, or the ratio of the structure of the glycans in, in IgGs, in antibodies, uh, is important. In, yep. in each antibody, the, the structure of both glycans is, is relevant. Mm -hmm. But we, if we uh, perform the profiling by HPLC, by hydrophilicity, we can't know uh, which uh, glycan is in each uh, position. By mass spec, I think, yeah. by glycopeptides, we can uh, identify the structure. But in the case of uh, ITGs, how can we know which glycans are in each side because yeah. the molecule is symmetrical? Right, yes. So obviously, if you're digesting into peptides, you lose information about, yeah when one sugar structure occurs on this site, what structure occurs on the other. Yeah. The, the only way you can do that is, is if you analyze the intact protein. Um, so th there are people who are doing uh, intact protein analysis of the IgG where they, they're getting molecular weight profiles. Um, from that, they, they can't necessarily say which structure is on which site. But if you combine that with the glycopeptide analysis, you can maybe reconstruct the information. But I think that is not an, an easy task to no. analyze, to know all the, the combinations of glycans in each antibody in a mixture of... Yes, okay. it, it's very difficult because um, you, you run into problems with um, stoichiometry, so the amount you have of a given type. So if one sugar structure is 90% and there, there are... Yeah, 20 others that are all less than 1%, then when you're doing the intact protein analysis, it's very difficult to see these very low stoichiometry ones because the signal from the 90% the sort of drowns it out. 
it's a little bit easier at the, at the peptide level, but then you, don't, you lose this information. And that was a very interesting question, right? Because we don't know if, like, there is um, any exclusion of, like, which glycoprofile you could get, and they need to be, like, balanced, or... I never thought about that. Any other question? Or remember, if you just don't want to speak English, we can translate. No. So let me remind everyone of uh, the workshop that or case study session we're having tomorrow at 9. And I know this uh, This is a very interesting uh, subject, and we all want to learn from it. But it's also a little bit complicated, for, uh, at least for my brain, still. So <laughs> if you come tomorrow, we'll be able to have a discussion. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that we will make Robert go down to our level, or at least my level, so, um, so we can really understand. And the most of and our Remember that our goal of all this workshop is to enable you to use these tools. So come tomorrow and we can discuss and um, also think about problems or things, questions. I really like your question, Tony, and of things that you would like to know. And, and I'm sure Robert can help um, giving us idea, ideas of how we can obtain the data that we need. Thank you, Robert, very much.